up, Kansas City? I'm your host, Glenn Brian Frizzell. Today we are taping the historic 18th and Vine Jazz District at the Lincoln Building, home of Cascade Media Group. Today's special guest works in the Academic Support and Mentoring Department at UMKC. We're glad that he could join us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please let's welcome Associate Director of Academic Development for UMKC, Mr. Rodney Smith, Ph.D. How are you doing today? Good. I'm doing well. Thanks, Glenn. Glad that you could join us today, Mr. Smith. We know the last time you were here, you talked to us a little bit about men, color campus initiative on UMKC. What's been going on with the initiative? You well, guys been meeting, studying? Yeah, they well, we meet on a regular basis and the, the guys they study together, they have study groups together, but we've also Excellent. had an opportunity to bring some key people, key individuals to campus. Last semester we had um, coach Mike Woodson, who was the head coach for the New York Knicks. I remember that. And he came to campus and he did a coach's clinic, but he also did um, our in our speaker series called Insight, and he offered words of wisdom of, you know, his trek from childhood to now being an NBA coach. That must have been amazing having an NBA coach talk to the students there. It, it, it was absolutely amazing, um, and it and also it was an opportunity for us to invite the community as well. So there were a lot of community members that came because they were interested. Because Mike, uh, in the beginning of his basketball career, when he played basketball, he played for... Uh, the Kansas City uh, Kings. Really? When the Kings were here in the city. In fact, he was one of the star players on um, perhaps the original team, I think. I'm not definitely sure, but he was a, a key part of uh, the Kansas City Kings when they were here in the city. So and, and he said, in some regards, it was like a homecoming for him. That coming. must have been exciting Absolutely. to have him here and able to share his knowledge of playing professional ball with the, the kids. There. Absolutely. And I think what was also enlightening for me and some of the students and many of the students is that his business acumen outside of basketball where um, he really doesn't need basketball. Basketball is a hobby, it's something that he loves to do. Coaching is something that he loves to do. He 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 likes the, the, part, the part of it that he has impact on these young men's lives. Um, but Outside of basketball, uh, he's a real estate mogul, if you will. He, he, he owns real estate around the country mm -hmm. and is doing quite well in his real estate business. So um, basketball, like I said, is something that is a hobby for him, something that he enjoys doing, but it's not anything that he needs to do for, for economic reasons. Real estate mogul, basketball, professional coach, that's a hard act to follow. What are you guys working on currently? Well, um, we, we Tomorrow and Saturday, we're partnering with um, the Association of Latin American Students, and they're having a leadership conference. Mm -hmm. So we do things like that around campus. Um, and, and a lot of times, simply because, you know, I'm an African-American gentleman, and a lot of the students are African-American, we only think about African-American students when we think about students of color. But um, in today's society, um, our Latino and Latina brothers and sisters are... Uh, are experiencing similar um, situations in this country based, you know, with regard to discriminatory actions and Certainly. marginalization and all those kinds of things. So I, I think it's, I think it is pretty powerful when the, when the black and brown community can come together in unity uh, for, for uh, a cause. That's it, the black and brown community. Now, Mr. Yeah. Smith, do you guys have any plans in terms of graduations coming up? I know for summer, uh, students are probably graduating, some are probably coming back. What's going to happen to Men of Color Campus in the fall? Well, we, we definitely, we celebrate first. We celebrate the young men who are graduating because that's a, probably the primary focus of our organization is to make sure these young men are completing college. That's perhaps the paramount reason we got together in the first place. We, we, because there is a, you know, you know the numbers. There are disparaging numbers that African American and Latino young men um, they come to college, but they don't finish college. Mm -hmm. And so we try to make a big deal out of when they uh, complete college because it is a big deal. Now, Mr. Smith, tell me this. Uh, I know that there are a lot of pressures, temptations on campus for men of color, both black and brown. Uh, we all have dreams, and we need to talk about our dreams. But do you guys talk about other things besides academics, drugs, sex, uh, dropout rate, perhaps? That's a good point, Glenn. We talk about those things because... Real conversations. Real conversations. We talk about relationships. We talk about, you know, jobs. We talk about money. We talk about, you know, making good decisions. Um, we, we talk about responsibility. We talk about living a disciplined life. We talk about um, your civic responsibility. 
Because a lot of times that when we do see the dropout rates, it's rarely connected to any issues relative to the young men's aptitude or intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's typically some sort of outside distraction. To talk about one young man recently lost his father. Wow. And so he's grieving his father, and as a result, his grades are slipping. Wow. So, you know, we, we try to rally around him and, and support him through his grieving process. I can only imagine. You, you know, so those kinds of things are the things that a lot of times um, serve as barriers to us where it's, we don't have a disdain for achievement or academic accomplishment. It's typically, it's typically, you know, some sort of outside distraction, some sort of social issue that causes, that can derail us sometimes. But for the most part, I'm not concerned about our aptitude. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always concerned about how we are living in the world. I think, I think we need to do a better job in the educational industry mm -hmm of educating the whole student mm -hmm. as opposed to I think we've we've gotten a little tunnel visioned and talking about the academic side mm -hmm. and not talk about the spiritual side or not talk about the emotional side or not even the physical I mean because we have to keep our physical bodies in shape you definitely you know definitely. um and you so don't those want lethargic energy absolutely with you you know we our have ability the, to do our job as well as we want to take care of our bodies and not misuse our bodies with drugs or even sex, you know, you know, with so many different partners and all those kinds of things, you run the risk of disease, you run the risk of a lot of things causing harm to you, your, your psyche, your emotional stability and all those kinds of things. So we, we, we talk about the full gambit. Now, Mr. Smith, uh, President Obama Initiative, let's take a walk out in the community for a little bit. Uh, My Brother's Keeper Initiative seeks to address men of color, mm -hmm. seeks to address getting young boys educated becoming educated men with careers, right. educated career, educated men with careers able to take care of their families. What would you like to see this recent initiative announced by the White House? What kind of effects do you think would be positive first uh, of all, for your community, the UMKC community? Oh, first of all, I'm really impressed that the president would do a, such an initiative. Mm. I even like the name of it, My mm -hmm. Brother's Keeper, because I think it sends, um, it insinuates, it sends a message to the young men that you are responsible for more than just yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you, if, you, if you are in position to help keep your brother, mm -hmm. um, then you may be in position later on in life to help keep your community. Something you may like be in, yeah, you may yeah. be in position to help keep your family. Right, and you know, reach back. And yes. reach back, yes. because I think, I think that's the most important, because I think Ob Obama is, is being an example of him reaching back. And I think it's very powerful for the first African American president, the 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 leader of the free world, as we like to refer to him as, you know, the most powerful man on earth, Isn't that something? to say, I'm concerned about you, um, you you African American young men, you Latino young men that are that are showing up at the bottom of every indicator, whether it's uh, health indicators, whether it's academic indicators. We're typically showing up at the bottom of the totem pole. Let's talk a little bit about reaching out and talking to our uh, kids while they're still children. I don't want to say kids, but our college students while they're still in high school. Um, we know that by the time they hit fourth grade, 86% of African-American boys and 82% of Hispanic boys are reading below proficiency levels, Mr. Smith, compared to 54% of white fourth graders reading below proficiency levels. African-American and Hispanic young men are more than six times as likely to be victims of murder than their white peers and account for almost half of the country's murder victims each year. Right. Um, while it's statistically more likely uh, for African Americans to make it in professional sports, some of us dream professional sports. Is this realistic? One in 3,500 black males go to uh, professional versus one in 10,000 white males. Uh, but two thirds of African American males between the ages of 13 and 18 believe they can earn a living mm -hmm. playing pro sports. What does it do to our ability as a community to recognize the importance of education when our youth are brainwashed by media entities? They see the Gucci, the Fly Girls, yeah. the bling bling that comes with sports professional lifestyle, but they don't see the work you have to do to buckle down for it, and they don't see the equal comparison with school and academics. Yeah. Uh, so, so you, you're speaking. Hope of, that's not too heavy. No, 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 no. I took you, an hour to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but you're speaking. You're speaking of a societal issue. You're speaking of a, um, a complete, you know, a American problem and even paradigm, um, where 
we we put a lot of emphasis and we put a lot of stock in um, athletics. Um, and, and, and I'm not even gonna say athletics. I'm gonna I'm gonna change the I'm gonna try to change the narrative um, because I think it's a, in some regards a disservice to even just call it athletics. I think it's bodily kinesthetic intelligence. I mean because there are things that these young men can do, and it's a form of intelligence first of all. And I think that may that may change our perception of it. But on but Read that. bodily kinesthetic intelligence, um, a form of intelligence. It's a form of intelligence. The, the a young man or a young woman who could coordinate their mind and their body to do certain things because everybody can't do it. Similarly, in the classroom, there are some students who are gifted in, in uh, uh, mathematics. Some, some, some students are gifted in linguistics. Is it in the genes? Is in it the, STEM cell ability? Well, it does. Some things are uh, natural gifts, yes, but some things are accomplished through skills. Thank and you. So, so there's a difference now. Say, for instance, um, it, Let's let's use Michael Vick for an example. Michael Vick is extremely gifted. He's naturally gifted in his abilities, God-given abilities. But in order for him to be the professional football player that he is, he's had to study at it because that brings in the skill portion. Michael Jordan perhaps would be a better example. Michael Jordan. He's an amazing. Example. He's a, he's an amazing athlete, but Michael Jordan. You know, a lot of people talk about this, and some people don't know this, that he was cut from the basketball team in the 10th grade. So that leads you that, that, that leads you to believe that he had to work at certain things in order to become the Michael Jordan that we now know. Mm -hmm. You know, but he did come to the table with some certain, certain uh, and he wasn't natural given a, gifts. A free pass, he wasn't given a free pass, pass, so he had to work at it. He yes. had to work at it. He had to work yeah. at it. And so, to, back to your point about reading, and, and so my, my, my advice... And my admonishment to parents and, and caregivers is turn the TV off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, TV is going to be a part of their lives regardless. I mean, weekend TV, one hour, two hours a day. But have your young men specifically read something every single day. Well, that's, that's day. kind of tough. We say we need to read something. And, and, and what, how, how are, I want to ask you. Even... Even if it's just a Jet magazine, even if it's just Ebony, and that's positive. We something, do need to do that. something that is of interest to them. Even if it's a magazine or a book about football, if it's a book about whatever they're interested in, if it's about astronomy, if it's about nature, you know, have them read something every single day, and the appetite and the aptitude for reading, I believe, will increase as a result. Now, Mr. Smith, I want to talk a little bit about mass media. Mm -hmm. uh, when we turn a microscope lens onto mass media, a lot of times we see the same images. Are we always being portrayed as uh, the angry thug, uh, the gangster wannabe, uh, the talented musician, the talented athlete? Right. Um, roles that only brothers uh, so far can, can get and have been stereotyped right. uh, throughout uh, decades. Right. Tell me there's some other roles out there. Tell me there's some positive images being broadcast the, into our community. There are definitely some positive so some positive images being broadcast into our community. The one that I can think of, we were talking about him earlier, President Barack Obama. Now think about it. This is the first time in uh, human history that there's been an African-American man as President of the United States. And so uh, me and a good friend, we've had an ongoing debate, if you will. Um, the, my, my point is, is there substance in the sim symbolism of seeing a black man as the president of the United States. My submission is there is great substance. I believe now that young African American men in particular, they can, they can truly aspire to be the president of the United States because they have an example of one. I believe that children will be what they see. And so if they see an African-American man as president, then they start to believe that maybe I can do that too. There's a great picture that's going on in, around the country that President Barack Obama had some visitors in the Oval Office about a year ago, maybe two years ago. And one of the visitors was a young African-American boy. It must have been, you know, six or seven, eight years old. And in the picture, Barack Obama was leaning over and the young man was touching Barack's hair. 
And I know that sounds insignificant, but I wonder what that young man will be one day because what he was doing was your hair is just like mine. Wow. Wow. And so I'm thinking that that impacted him in a way that you're just like me. Wow. And But you're the president of the United States. So my submission is there is substance in the symbolism of seeing a black man disembarking from Air Force One. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm a black man standing at the presidential podium. Mm -hmm. So you talk about those images. So that's an inadvertent image that we may not see or we may not readily interpret as a positive image that black men will see. I believe that we have yet to see the impact the power of those images of a black man or a black family. I remember when the young when when Obama's daughters Sasha and Malia stepped on stage that night when he was first being inaugurated, not inaugurated, but when he came out to do his acceptance speech. And I asked my daughter, who was, um, who how old was she? She was six at the time. She's now 12. She was six, and I was like, her name is Phoenix. I said, Phoenix, what do you like about this situation? She said, I love their dresses. Wow, wow, that's amazing, Mr. Smith. She, but she connected with them because they were similar to her. Yes. I love their hair. Yes. Because they were similar to her. They had dresses similar to her dresses. Young princes. Young princes. Princesses. Yes. You know? And so I think seeing all that, or, or Michelle Obama, what an image for young African-American women to, to emulate themselves. And I'd like to add yeah. one to that. One to your image there. I yeah. was watching some time back, really impressed the autobiographical story of Dr. Ben Carson. In it, his mother was played by Kimberly Release. And like you said, she sharply limited the amount of TV her boys would watch. They had to do assignment each right. week and they had to do a book report and report back to her. Not that much TV watching. Right. Uh, and it, watching that, Mr. Smith, it kind of communicated the message to me that we should be able to talk to anyone, whether they're Ivy League educated or blue collar educated. That's right. I want to ask you about your doctor's degree and okay. your colleagues there. I see people that I went to school with. Um, I went to Howard University. Right. Uh, the program that I was in was BA, Broadcast Journalism. So I go in there with the mindset that all I need is a BA. But I see other people who went on to get uh, doctor's degrees in philosophy and communication culture and history uh, and it, it seems like there is really this culture they're always teaching publishing writing is it pressure in today's academic uh, environment to be a PhD of substance how much energy is required to do what you do successfully well there is there is considerable energy put into it um, to be a, a, someone at a doctoral level um, but my motivation for going to school and getting a doctoral degree, I don't think, I liked, I'd like to believe it wasn't personal. Um, because I believe that, you know, this may sound elitist, but I want you to understand truly what I'm saying. I want, I want the audience to understand truly what I'm saying. That There was a, there was a, a quote, my, my, when my family and I lived in Nashville, my daughter's school, she went to a private school called East Academy. And when you walked into the school, there was a quote on the wall by a Greek philosopher, Epictetus. And the quote said, only the educated are free. Mm. I was like, that's a little off-putting. That's, that's, that's saying that, you know, if you're not educated, then you're not free. And so I was thinking in the formal sense of education, you know, being that I'm someone with a doctoral degree. Um, but I thought more about that and, you know, I, I began to de debate in my mind what that meant. And I think what it means is education in the sense that you know who you are. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. um, to thy own self be true. To thy own self be true. That, you know, that you know where you come from. And if you do, if you know that, you may know you have may you may have an idea where you may want to go. Those are powerful words. You know, so the education for me was um, then if only the educated are free, then the purpose of education then has to be freedom. Mm -hmm. If only the educated are free, mm -hmm. so why? So I would you know I would never equate my education with money because a lot of times you know you would hear people say. Go to school, get a good education so you can get a good job, make a lot of money. I mean, there are a lot of people that that, that, that do things for money. 
you equate yours with freedom I, and with, with knowledge and being able to exactly interact and act in that environment. And then I'm going somewhere. And then when I when I create when I, so then if I if I achieve this freedom, then what is the purpose of freedom then? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For me to create it for others, because that's it, the price you pay. You know what I mean. But my freedom then I w I don't want to be the only one that's free. It's similar to. Harriet Tubman, when she was freeing other slaves, helping other slaves to be free, she had tasted the joys, the sweetness of freedom. And so she wanted to create that freedom for others. That's Harriet Tubman. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> she, she wanted to create that freedom That's for others. That's a sweet picture. That's a sweet picture, man. But that she, she, she received freedom. And so she was like, I don't want this for myself. I want to help others create it. So, and at one point in time in this country, African Americans could not even read. It was against the law for us to read. And now, not too long ago. Not too long ago. And now here it is. I'm talking to you as a doctor of education. Yes, sir. You know, so, you know, my goal in life is to help teach others to read. That's all. That, that, so that's why I'm seeking freedom, so I can help create freedom for others. So, so I know that's a long answer to, to, to your question, but... It, but gotta, gotta be... Uh... Cautious what you ask the doctor. <laughs> you might get more than you bargained for. Absolutely. But you, you certainly answered my question and give it, giving me food for thought, Mr. Smith. Do you have any final words? Can, can we wrap up and talk a little bit about Men of Color Campus Initiative? Again, how they could get in contact with you and possibly something that will be going on in the near future? Yeah, well, the, the Campus Initiative at UMKC was designed, we launched it in 2012. It was designed to enhance student life and learning for all students, but with a special emphasis on male students of color, students who come from underrepresented, underserved communities. And how can we get in touch with you? Well, we, you, of course, you can go to our, to our website, uh, www.umkc.edu. Um, me particularly, you can just say backslash SI because I'm in the academic support and mentoring department, but I'm, I'm also the advisor and mentor, I like to say, big brother, uncle to the Middle of Color Campus Initiative because this is a student-led, student-ran organization. They have officers and these young men are, um, they, 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 they span the, the gambit of majors, uh, classifications. We have freshmen to seniors that are involved in the organization. Um, and so you can, if you know any of the young men that's a part of the, the Middle of Color Campus Initiative on campus, um, you can definitely find out more about the organization through them. But go to our website and go to uh, student organizations and you'll see a list of student organizations and Men of Color Camps Initiative is listed as one of those student organizations. And you know, like I said, I simply serve as one of the advisors. I was the inaugural advisor. Now we have a co-advisor, uh, Dr. Uziel Pacina, who's a Latino brother, who's a professor in the School of Education. Um, I, we, we, we jokingly call each other, uh, uh, I call him my Latino brother, he calls me uh, his African American brother. Um, <laughs> Uh, so you can kindred folks. Eh? Yeah, kindred. We kindred, kindred spirits. spirits. No, you're you're absolutely right. A absolutely right. Now I, I recognize him. Okay. You know? Okay. I now I have to ask before we totally wrap up here: Is there a chapter of Omega Sci-Fi on UMKC's campus? There is not a chapter of Omega Sci-Fi, but we're in the works right now because I am a member of Omega Sci-Fi. Of course, you remember that from last time I was here. But yeah, and we're we um, we're talking about um, cautiously. Talking about bringing a, an Omega chapter back on, on campus. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. What's up, Kansas City? I'm your host, Glenn Bryan Frizzell. Thank you for tuning in today. Our guest has been Mr. Smith. We are going to have to invite him back sometime fall, maybe even sooner. Talk with us more about the initiatives that are going on UMKC's campus. Check out his website. Check out our website for more videos, www.whatsupkansascity.net. And remember, the sky's the limit. Aim high. If you shoot for the moon and you miss, at the very least, you would have landed among the stars. Take care until next time. Thank you. CMG wants you to always remember the victory we call success goes to the best prepared. When you invest in your community, you're really just investing in yourself. Thanks.